Hi, once again, from Bethel Baptist Church, your source for Bible-believing preaching. All right, I would like to begin tonight with uh, song 160 in the new hymn book, Crown Him With Many Crowned. It's a hymn uh, to the honor and glory of our Lord Jesus Christ, in whom we will cast down all the crowns that uh, he blesses us with in our lifetime. So we'll have a word of prayer, and we'll begin to sing uh, Heavenly Father, we want to thank you once again for this great opportunity to present the word of truth, as it is in truth, that word of yours. And so we ask you, Father, for grace tonight. May the Spirit of God touch hearts. May we ourselves conform ourselves to the word we hear tonight. We thank you for all these wonderful things. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Crown him with many crowns. Crown him with many crowns. The Lamb upon his throne. Hark how the heavenly anthem drowns all music but its own. Awake my soul and sing of him who died for thee. And hail him as thy matchless king through all eternity. Crown him the Lord of love. Behold his hands and side. Rich wounds yet visible above, in beauty glorified. No angel in the sky can fully bear that sight, but downward bends his wandering eye at mystery so bright. Crown him the Lord of life, who triumphed o'er the grave, who rose victorious to the strife for those he came to save. His glories now we sing, who died and rose on high, who died eternal life to bring, and lives that death may die. Crown him the Lord of heaven, one with the Father known, one with the Spirit through him given from yonder glorious throne. To thee be endless praise, for thou for us hast died, be powerful, Lord, through endless days, adored and magnified. When we sing these hymns, I hope you sing with the understanding of them because it's so important. Otherwise, it's just become any old song. You know? I mean, we, we sing with the understanding, we pray with the understanding, we preach with the understanding that God's word is true. If you haven't come to that conclusion in your lifetime, with all of your education and all of your wisdom, uh, think about what God has done in giving us his thoughts and his mind in the word of God. The Bible itself claims it's not the complete revelation of God. It's not everything that God would have to know. Even Jesus told his disciples that, he, that we couldn't handle certain things now. So some of these things people call the deep things. You know, those, those things there are things that God has kept to himself. But he will reveal them to us one day you know, when we're together with him. Uh, but the things that are really the deep things are, are what we practice in our daily life. That's the deep thing. Are we kind? Are we gracious? Are we loving? Do we have peace? Do we produce the, the fruit of the Spirit? You know, is it evident in our lives? Those are the deep things of God, that we walk in love one toward another. <clears throat> All right, uh, what I want to speak to you uh, from tonight is Hebrews chapter number 4. And there's so much unrest in the world uh, at this time, and actually all the time, just sometimes it's, it's less of a... Uh, of a problem, less chaos than other times, but there's always something going on. If it's not on a large scale, it's usually just ourselves, you know. So we're going to look at some of these things, but before we get into Hebrews chapter 4, I want to read to you a couple of verses uh, from the book of Job, supposedly the oldest book in the Bible. Job chapter 5 and verse number 7 says, Yet man is born unto trouble as the sparks fly upward. Think about that campfire or you know, you're burning some trash 
uh, makes me think about the lake of fire. It makes me think about the works and the judgment seat of Christ being burned up where there, there had no true significance uh, to our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now think about that and you watch the sparks go up and the, and the wood crackling in there and, and realizing, you know, it's mesmerizing. It's just something that you, your eyes lock on and it does something. And I think it's a reminder to us about that's how life is. It's full of trouble. And the sparks fly upward. The next place is in Job chapter 14. <clears throat> Here it says in verse 1, Man that is born of a woman, and every man is born of a woman. Uh, we know that the woman was taken from the rib of the man, and God created her. We're going to touch on that a little bit. But man that is born of a woman is a few days. The Bible says that our lives have been uh, cut short down to three score and ten years. We'll be 70 years old. So if you live over than that, then, you know, if you're healthy and you're wise and able to get around, that's great. God bless you. But the average age of life is 70 years. All right, so man that is born of a woman is a few days and full of trouble. He cometh forth like a flower, uh, like a newborn baby, and he's cut down. <laughs> he fleeth also as a shadow and continueth not. In other words, we appear for a little time and then... Uh, just life just vanishes away from us. Uh, verse 3 says, And dost thou open thine eyes upon such an one, and bringest me into judgment with thee? Who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean, not one? Seeing his days are determined, the number of his months are with thee. Thou hast appointed his bounds that he cannot pass. Turn from him that he may rest, till he shall accomplish as a hireling his day. For there is hope of a tree, if it be cut down, that it will sprout again, and that the tender branch thereof will not cease. Maybe you've seen that. You cut a tree down, all of a sudden something sprouts up again, and the tree still has some life. It's because of the root system. It says, Though the root thereof wax old in the earth, and the stock thereof die in the ground, yet through the scent of water it will bud and bring forth boughs like a, boughs like a plant. But man dieth and wasteth away, yea, man giveth up the ghost, and where is he? Well, the Bible answers those questions. And those of you who've been struggling with uh, the troubles and the problems of this life, or just your own personal problems like that, I want to talk to you about my resting place, a place where I have found peace and comfort. It's not a, a place in my house, uh, you know, like the, the man cave or anything like that. Uh, it's not uh, some spot upon the earth by the water side or the ocean or up in the mountains or anything like that. It's in a person. It's in the person. His name is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is my resting place. Now, I'd like to explain to you some things about people who are doing all kinds of things. They're trying this and they're trying that, hoping that the one that they believe in, God, uh, will accept uh, their lifestyle will accept them uh, in, in the things that they're believing that are not based on the Word of God. So with that, I want to start from Hebrews chapter number 4. Uh, verses 1 through 10 will suffice for the message tonight. Uh, Let us therefore fear, that's important that we fear God, uh, because the Bible says don't fear man who has only the power to kill you, but fear him rather who has, after he has killed you, has the power to cast into hell. <clears throat> For those of you who've been thinking, that, well, you know, the Bible's full of baloney. No, it's full of truth. And you'll be full of baloney one day. So let's see. Uh, let us therefore fear lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached, as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. In other words, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So we are, we are encouraged, we are exhorted to preach the word, to cry aloud the word of the Lord, that people may hear, because by hearing the word of God, uh, same as reading it, but by hearing the Word of God, faith rises up within us. That's how God has designed us. He's designed us that way. Uh, <clears throat> goes on in verse 3, it says, For we which have believed do enter into rest, as he said, As I have sworn in my wrath that they shall enter into my rest. 
although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. Now the works are the works of God. Those are the works God did. He, six days he created this, he created the other things, he prepared all these things, and on the seventh day he rested. And now we, we read here again in verse 4, uh, for he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works. And in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest. So now the argument comes from the writer of Hebrews. Uh, again, he limit, uh, seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief, Again, he limiteth a certain day. God is not always going to strive with you, unbeliever. God is not always going to strive with you who rejects his word. One day, that end is going to come. Maybe, maybe you'll have passed away by then and ended up in hell. But in the meantime, while you're alive, God is striving with you. He's calling you unto himself so that you would enter into his rest and take care of all the struggling and doubt and uh, unbelief that you have in your own heart. And so again, he says here, seeing therefore he made it that some must enter therein. He's talking about you. He's talking about you, unbeliever. He's talking about you who don't believe the word of God. And they to whom it was first preached enter not in because of unbelief. Then it goes on today. Today, in verse 7, if ye will hear his voice, not mine, but his voice, his voice is the word of God, harden not your hearts. For if Jesus had given them rest, then they would be, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day. There remained therefore a rest to the people of God. Now the people of God are not every human being walking the face of the earth. The people of God are those who love him, who trust him, who believe him, who embrace uh, the sacrificial uh, completeness of Jesus Christ. Believe he that hath the Son hath life. He that believeth not the Son hath not life. You understand that? That is S-O-N, Son, the Son of God. For he that has entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works as God did from his. Just a quick explanation of that. You call upon the Lord Jesus Christ to be your Savior. You've entered into God's rest. You don't have to work at being saved. Uh, you are not expected to strive and go through a bunch of religious uh, exercises or uh, things that you think are necessary for salvation. God wants to give you the gift of eternal life freely. Jesus Christ paid the full price. All you must do is believe that Jesus Christ did that and call upon him to be your Savior. And God will seal you until the day of redemption and deliver you out of this wicked world. Not now, but at the day of salvation, the day either when the Lord returns in the clouds to gather up the church, or if you should pass on from this life. Where do you stand today? All right. So God sees from his work. I ceased from my work. I'm no longer working. My, my position as a pastor, as a preacher, does not mean uh, that I'm earning my way into glory. I, I've been given eternal life already over 40 years ago when I called upon Jesus Christ to be my Savior, and he's never failed me yet. I failed him, but he's never failed me. Now, someone or something always needs attention. Now I'm going to get into the message here. Whether the work is mentally fatiguing or physically exhausting, it, it's nonetheless tedious, and it, and, and it has to be done by someone. Work is a necessity in this life. God commanded it to Adam. He said, you will earn your bread by the sweat of your brow, and he cast him out of the garden. That place of peace, that place of abundance, now he was out on his own. And so you're out on your own. And now we see these things come to the past. Um, uh, many machines, many contraptions, many inventions have been developed for ease of life uh, and great productivity. And we see that in manufacturing. So many things for the comfort of man, for the provision of man. 
And the God has given us those things, uh, men with wisdom, men, women with wisdom to develop these things. It's an amazing truth. Man, though, is so infused with the requirement for labor, to labor for everything that he needs, he mistakenly misapplies this requirement to obtain salvation from God. It's free. You can't work for it. God won't give it to you if you even try to work for it. It says so right in the Word of God, and I'll give you that verse shortly. So it seems only natural that man would think of it this way, that since work is required for our physical survival, well, it must be required for our spiritual survival as well. But, but that's not true at all, not according to the Word of God. Now, all opinions of men aside, let's allow the Bible to speak to us on this very important and urgent issue. From the outset, in the beginning, Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, all right, God has supplied everything for mankind for him to live on this earth. Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2 give you the rundown. In contrast to evolutionary theory, the account of biblical creation is founded upon the intelligence of an all-wise creator. It, it, it makes logical sense, and it provides answers to most of the questions which have puzzled evolutionists for a very long time. This is the testimony right now uh, I'm going to read to you from Isaiah of God by the prophet Isaiah. In Isaiah 45, 18, it says this, For thus saith the Lord that created the heavens, God himself that formed the earth and made it. He hath established it. He created it not in vain. He formed it to be inhabited. All right, so that's very important for you to understand. God is the one who's going to destroy the earth. Man can try as hard as he will. He's not going to destroy this planet. God, God said he's going to save that for himself to do uh, when he creates a new heaven and a new earth. Another reason for you to get saved. If you want to be a part of that eternal life, you need to call upon the Lord Jesus Christ to be your Savior. God formed the earth to be a habitable place. Everything was prepared before man took his first step, before man spoke his first word, and the first thing that Adam saw when God breathed in him the breath of life was his creator. Well, how else would Adam know who walked with him in the garden if he didn't know who his creator was? Now, Adam was made complete and mature as a man, fully able to reproduce, but there was no one to reproduce with. So God saw it was not right that man should be alone, and it wasn't good. So he took a rib out of Adam, and that's the story. That's better than evolution, i got to tell you. That, you might doubt that, but that's... You think about modern medicine, what they can do. How you can grow a full bone from another tiny part of a bone. It's just amazing. We're finding these things out year after year after year. And the DNA chain and all of those things, it's just amazing. You're going to find out, and science is going to discover that the Bible is absolutely true. And so if that's so, and I believe it is, these things are important that you hear. Now, Adam was given the task of tending the Garden of Eden. And it was a joyful, pleasurable, and, and glorious experience. He was serving the Creator. And one-on-one -on -one fellowship every day. I mean, we, we, we struggle with one-on-one -on -one fellowship with the Lord every day. You know, sometimes a preacher will get up or some brother or sister will say, Oh, did you, say, did you talk with the Lord today? And right away you're under conviction because, you know, you didn't spend much time doing that. It's the way we are, you know. But I will tell you that they had one-on-one -on -one fellowship with every day. Every day enjoying the wonderful qualities of the Creator. Everything was fresh and new. Uh, we like fresh and new things. Uh, it was a joy. There was no toil, no sweat, amen? And, and no hard tasks were there. Man was in good standing with the Creator. All was at peace. The animals were at peace with the, each other and the human and the environment and man. It, just, it was pleasurable. Pleasurable. Don't you seek out a pleasurable place where you can go and enjoy what you call life? I'll tell you, man was at his highest position at that time given dominion over all things on the earth. 
Uh, he had responsibility for them. Uh, he named all the things on the earth. Uh, <laughs> intelligence. He had intelligence. God created him that way. Adam was the only creature that God had made in his own image. That should tell you something. We're not animals. We're animated, but we're not animals. But temptation got the best of Eve, and Adam followed her example, and sin entered into the world, along with its faithful companion, death. Now, all of man's glory was lost at that time. He forfeited it by his own disobedience. Genesis chapter 3, verse 17 reminds us, And unto Adam he said, God said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall I bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. And the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. Think about that the next time you try to grow a garden. Think about that the next time uh, you see uh, uh, things that uh, amaze you, but you're not certain about where they came from. And then what happens to you on a daily basis? Again, you might be sweating because you're working outside in the heat and you're breaking rock or you're uh, building a, a structure, or you could be sweating it out in an office in the front of a computer and trying to figure things out mentally. Either one of those things is exhausting, and it causes you to sweat. And so we prove the Word of God is true. It's a true scientific fact that's demonstrable. The biblical statement that we just read proves its truth to us on a daily basis. Now this world has been placed under a curse. God placed it under a curse. It wasn't the devil who did that. Man disobeyed God, the devil did the tempting, but man's the one who disobeyed God. And so God says, if you did that, you're going to die. And so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. So, the Apostle John states it very bluntly in 1 John chapter 5, verse 19, the whole world lieth in wickedness. Now, the earth is not the world, and the world is not the earth. The earth is the physical structure that we walk upon. The world is what goes on on the, on the earth human associations and those things. And lately you've been seeing how those things have been going. Now, the requirement of man is that he labor, that he work. Uh, and if you don't, someone else does. We have a system here in the United States, uh, Social Security, and people who work through their lives and they put into that Social Security, they get that back uh, in portions uh, at the end of their retirement. Uh, days. And that's all figured out. It's all done by the numbers. And uh, if you don't work and put into that, somebody else had to work and put into that for you. Work has to happen. It has to happen so you can eat. It has to happen so you can provide for yourself, for your family, for other people. And it has to happen so that you can satisfy your flesh with comforts. Now, since God condemned with the curse this earth, man has endeavored to make his own labor less strenuous. Doesn't want to sweat. Doesn't want to do things. Got to produce more. So his inventions, using the wisdom of God, gave him. You know, they uh, they produced these wonderful machines who could uh, plant hundreds of acres of wheat and corn and all, all things of that that nature. Uh, design air conditioning. Design uh, comfortable beds, right? Uh, there's so many commercials on TV, I gotta say. Many of them have to do with comfort, right? Medicines, and uh, your headache is bothering you so much, or, you know, buy this and buy this car for your comfort, buy this one, that thing. Oh, yeah, that's what it's all about. Think about it. Now, he's, he's laboring, man labors to make his work less strenuous, and at the same time, he's making it harder. For him to restore his once glorious fellowship with the God who created him. The reason, according to Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 19, 
is unbelief. Because they don't believe God. They believe that man is the epitome of all things. That man is the boss and there's no such thing as God. God over us. And if you, in many people who believe in a God, they have their own imagination what he is. Well, the Bible tells us who he is. God is the spirit. And Jesus Christ is his son. And he's in the flesh. He's sitting at the right hand of the Father. And the Holy Spirit is in the world doing his work of convicting, of, ju of judgment and of righteousness and of sin. Yeah. The guilty feelings you get, that's not your conscience really anymore. It's the word of God being preached to you. You want that to be hidden away. But man uh, has wearied himself, wore himself out uh, uh, with all sorts of religious imaginations and, and anecdotes promising to bring them to God, promising an entrance into heaven. Uh, but it offers so little consolation. Very, very minimal. And, and the consolation that you have and the rest that you think you have that you're doing the right thing will only last until you draw your last breath. You need something that's going to carry you through after you breathe your last breath, friend. You need something, uh, you need someone to meet you on that other side who's going to bring you to God. And that's no other than Jesus Christ. He said that he had to do that. He's alive forevermore. He's the one you need to put your faith and trust in. You don't need to put your faith and trust in a church. You don't put it in your baptism. You don't put it in your, uh, your mass or your Lord's Supper. You don't put it in anybody lower than Jesus Christ, and he's the highest you can reach. Jesus said, no man can come unto the Father but by me. You're in trouble if you don't go through Jesus Christ. Now, I want to read to you something from Hebrews chapter 6. In Hebrews chapter 6, we find something that's very, very uh, pointed and direct. Hebrews chapter 6, verses 17 to, to the first part of verse 20. All right, so I'm going to find it right here. Wherein God willing. God is willing. He's not willing that any should perish, but God is willing. More abundantly than you are, more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath. So God has some counsel to give you. Look unto me, all ye of the earth, and be saved. He gives you counsel. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. He gives you counsel. And then he confirms it. Those are the two immutable things. The all-wise God has got counsel for you, and he's given it to you. Here's my son. Believe on him. I've raised him from the dead. I'll raise you from the dead, and you'll be with me for all eternity. And we'll live in glory and fellowship together. Reject that truth, you'll burn forever in the lake of fire. Check it out. It's in Revelation chapter 20. So where in God, willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath, that by two immutable things, his counsel and his confirmation of his counsel, in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil, whither the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus. Jesus is waiting for you. He's waiting for you to repent of your sin and belief, unbelief, and he wants you to trust what he has done on your behalf. That's what he wants. And so we see these things as, as this unfolds. So, God, all by himself, has given us, in this age, in our time period, the opportunity to enter into his rest. And not some thinking that, well, we're okay, I'm okay, I'm good. You know, say, people, hey, here's a gospel, try to tell you about how to get to heaven. No, I'm good. No, the Bible says there's none good. No, not one. Your unbelief is going to seal your uh, eternal death. But you'll be alive. It's, it's like a, the living dead in that lake of fire. Now, we're going to look at some of man's foolish devices, foolish inventions, okay? 
There are many interesting ideas floating around out in the world there about God, about man, about heaven and hell. And men tenaciously hold to those things. Men and women both. Oh, yeah, they're, they're fierce about that. But there's not one solid scriptural foundation based on what the Bible says. These are just imaginations of the mind. With the idea, they think they're at rest, and they've got the answer, but they have no rest. With the idea that everything one does makes heaven all the more obtainable. That's wrong. Jesus died for, uh, for all mankind. It doesn't matter what nationality you are, what color you are. He tells you to repent and believe on him and his Savior. People think, well, he died fighting for his country in a war. He's got to be in heaven. I see it all the time, these, these uh, pictures on social media showing, you know, just a picture about someone who passed away and they go into glory. Uh, oh, but she took so extra special care of her family. She's certainly uh, so good. She's going to get into heaven. No, none of those ways are going to get anybody into heaven. It's faith in Jesus Christ. I don't know how many times that's going to have to be told you in your life before you wake up finally. Now, some ways that people try uh, to imagine they can earn heaven uh, are very physically severe on the body, the human body. Uh, when they fast uh, long time, long periods of time, and uh, trying to think that if I can just fast or put away all the aesthetics, all the things, uh, all the comforts, and, and live like a hermit or something like that, that God will, that'll bring me close to God. No, it won't bring you close to death. That's what that'll do. Uh, Self-flagellation, you ever see some of these people, they have whips with little metal shards or bone on it, and they whip themselves in the back, similar to what they used on Jesus Christ. All right, like a cat of nine tails, and they, they make themselves bleed. That, that, no, I, would, I would tell you, bloodletting, that's wrong in God's eyes. What, what does that do? Jesus shed his blood for you. You don't need to shed your blood for him. But there are many believers who have shed their blood for him because of unbelievers who put them to death. Again, fear not man, who after he's finished with you can only kill you, but fear God, whom after he's killed you, We'll put you in the lake of fire. And then there's pilgrimages. People take these pilgrimages on their knees. They, uh, the intention of causing pain. They do that intentionally. As if making oneself endure extreme pain pleases God. It doesn't please God. Life is very often painful enough without inflicting unnecessary suffering on yourself. And every way of man, every plan, every way that man... Uh, tries uh, to accommodate God, falls flat on its face. Makes him a, a, a sort of a mental madhouse. They always question, well, have I done the right thing? Yeah, I think I've done the right thing, but I'm not really sure if I've done the right thing. Uh, have I done it long enough? Yeah, I, well, you know, I've been doing this for like 40, 50 years, uh, repeating the uh, mantras, you know, the Hail Marys and the Our Fathers and all that stuff. Uh, have I done it well enough? Have I, have I done it uh, uh, often enough? Constant anguish, struggling with the uncertainty of man's rules and traditions. There's no rest in the ways of man. Not the rest that God wants to give you. He trusts in himself, and that is the problem between him and God. You need to stop trusting yourself, start believing the Bible, and start trusting God. Or... Start trusting God and start trusting the Bible. You can prove it. Just, just ask God, is your word true? He'll show it to you if you've got an honest heart. <clears throat> now, God has made his truth crystal clear in the Bible. That's crystal clear about salvation. We might not get everything right. Uh, Baptists, I know, don't have everything right. But I'll tell you that uh, we get salvation right because it's very plain in the Bible. He's made that crystal clear in the Bible. Man has polluted it and perverted it by adding to it or substituting his own solutions in place of the Word of God. The Apostle Paul made the same observation when he commented in Romans chapter 10, verses 2 through 4, which says, For I bear them record. He's talking about his own countrymen. He's talking about the Jewish nation 
whom he tried to minister to. He says, I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they being <clears throat> ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness. See, that's what works are. You're trying to establish how good you are to, before God, how good you are to man, and what, you, what you've accomplished in your life is all, look, God, look how great I am. That's not how it is. God's going to say to you, my son did all this for you. I'm looking to him. He's, he's your salvation. You're, you're not going to earn salvation. It's a free gift. So then he goes on, and he says they haven't uh, submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. And that's what we need to do. We need to submit ourselves to God's righteousness. And he, when we believe him, according to his word, that Jesus Christ is our only hope, he accounts, he puts Christ's righteousness, deservedly so, upon our account. And we're made righteous in God's sight. Yeah, even when I have an argument with somebody or my wife or, you know, or I get in a bad mood, I, I've got God's righteousness through Jesus Christ. I don't always do the right thing. I don't always do the kind thing. But I will tell you this. Uh, God always does. And God's not a man that he should lie. You ought to start believing God. Maybe you ought to start reading some of the things that God's wrote down so you could believe him more than what you think you believe in. So then he, he zeroes in. Paul zeroes in uh, in Romans chapter 10 <clears throat> on the correct way, God's way, to one very sharp point. Verse 4 says, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. See, not work it, but believe it. And it's Christ's righteousness. Verse 9 says, That if thou shalt confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, not to some priest, not to your pastor, not to your rabbi, none of that stuff, but you, you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. Yes, you confess that I believe you, Jesus. And believe in your heart, not up here in your brain, in your heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. You know, how, how could you argue with that? For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You got a better way? It won't work. Only belief, only faith, only trust in Jesus Christ will give this rest of God that the Bible speaks of. A rest from your works in the futile attempts you make to satisfy the one true and living God. You must come to understand this truth. It is not about you being satisfied with your effort. It is about you and me being satisfied with God's finished sacrifice and only then can his rest become yours. Titus chapter 3 verse 5. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Hebrews chapter 4 verse number 10. For he that has entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works as God did from his. Listen, I'm not trying to get a, man, a better place in heaven by being a pastor. I felt the call of God upon my heart when I, when I first got saved. It took me a while to come to this, to this point in my life. But I, I, I believe with all my heart that God called me to to preach his word, to teach his word. Now, people might argue with that. No, your argument is with God, not with me. So, this rest, I'm not doing this so I can get to heaven. I trust Christ. If I never became a pastor, if I never became a church member, I'm trusting Jesus Christ. Are those things good? Yes, they're good. Are there rewards associated with that? Probably. If you do right and you do it with a, a true heart Sunday school teacher same thing Man, is your heart right when you teach those kids when you teach those grown ups in the adult Sunday school class is your heart right with God if it's not so what are you working it for forget it you're going to get no reward for that 
But I'm, my, I rested in Jesus Christ. He's my resting place. I'll tell you this. Uh, now, God's rest is obtained through faith alone. Now, I'm going to take a Bible verse out of Acts chapter 16, verse number 31. A part of it. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Let's break it down. Believe, okay? Now, you have to have faith, because without faith, it's impossible to please God. So you must believe. People believe all kinds of things, but, oh boy, now it says believe on. Believe on. That means your faith has to be on something, or someone, or some truth. And then the next one says believe on thee. Now it's getting specific. Now it's really getting right down to the nitty-gritty here. A specific thing, not just anything. Oh, I got faith. Keep the faith. You don't know what you're talking about. They coin these phrases, and they just throw you right off all the time. Take the word of God. Stand on that truth. Believe on the Lord. Oh, Lord. Okay. Well, which one? You know, the Bible in 1 Corinthians 8, 5 says, For though there be that are called gods, whether in heaven or in earth, as there be gods many and lords many, oh, which God are you talking about? Which Lord are you talking about? They've got all kinds of thoughts in their brain, wondering, you know, thinking about what God is. He's, he's a force field. He's this. You know, he's a shining light. Take a look at Revelation chapter 1. Give you a good idea who Jesus Christ is. No, it says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible is very narrow-minded where it pertains to the who, how, and why of salvation. Matthew 7, 14, because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life and few there be that find it. You know who said that? Jesus Christ. Imagine Jesus. Oh, he's supposed to be the Savior of the world. Then how come we're not all going to heaven? He says, there's many people who won't, just, just won't believe. Just won't believe. That's the whole deal. John 14, 6, Jesus saith unto him, and I said this earlier, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Acts 4, 12 says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. 1 John 5, 12 says, He that hath the Son, S-O-N, hath life, and he that hath not the Son, S-O-N, of God, hath not life. Romans 8, 31 tells us this. Now, this is the comfort for the believers. These are the people who believe. They have this comfort and truth. Romans 8, 31 says, What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Amen? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Eternal life, salvation, forgiveness of sins, a home in heaven, a heavenly Father, a Holy Spirit within us, a Holy Bible that we can believe and read and preach and be at peace with. Who shall lay, it continues, anything to the charge of God's elect? That's those who come to know Jesus Christ as their Savior. Uh, for those of you of a different persuasion, I have to tell you that uh, God does not elect you first. You, you, you believe first. He calls you first. And then you either choose or you refuse. That's how that is. There's not a certain group of people that God's appointed unto destruction and God's appointed unto eternal life. He's given everyone a free will. Whosoever will. Amen? That's what it is. Whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Do you get it yet? 2,000 years we've been preaching this message. <laughs> and yet Jesus said, Broad is the way, and, there, and wide is the gate that leads to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Are you one of those? Or are you taking the narrow way, Jesus Christ? Now listen. It says, Who is he that condemneth? Verse 34 of Romans chapter 8. It says, Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, he rather, rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Dear people, the rest of God or God's rest is sufficient for everyone. Have you entered into his rest through faith in Christ Jesus? Because that's the only way you can get it. Not by being religious, not by, uh, you know, doing imaginary things you think are pleasing to God. God's interested in your eternal soul. And your eternal soul will live for all eternity. 
somewhere. Jesus said there was two places, eternal life with him in glory or eternal death in the lake of fire, where there is no real death as you know it. Verse chapter 3 of Hebrews chapter 4 says this, For we which have believed do enter into rest. I'm resting. I, I'm not working for heaven. I'm not hoping I've done enough. I'm not, I, I don't think I, you know, match up to a lot of men who are preachers or pastors. But the fact remains is that I'm not concerned about that getting me into heaven. I'm just concerned about is my life now pleasing to God. He's accepted me. He'll accept you. But you've got to come to God in his way. Now, there's this woman. I think her name is Liddy. Uh, L-I-D-I-E. could be Lydie, but I think it's Liddy Edmonds. She penned the words to the hymn, My Faith Has Found a Resting Place. And I'd like to just read it to you. My faith has found a resting place, not in device, that would be works, or creed. I trust the ever-living one, his wounds from me shall flee. He's talking about the Lord Jesus. I need no other argument. I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. Enough for me that Jesus saves. This ends my fear and doubt. A sinful soul, I come to him. He'll never cast me out. He said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. My heart is leaning on the word. The written word of God, salvation by my Savior's name, salvation through his blood. My great physician heals the sick, the lost he came to save. For me, his precious blood he shed, for me, his life he gave. I need no other argument, I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. And he died for you also, my friend. Jesus' yoke is easy and his burden is light. Those of us who have entered into his rest by faith alone in Jesus Christ finished sacrifice are now enjoying the rest he has given us as a preview or precursor to the magnificent and wondrous things that he has prepared for those that love him. Why go on in your struggles? Why go on repeating things that you think are right? when they're absolutely wrong and unnecessary. Come and get your rest from God through Jesus Christ. Call upon Him. There's perfect peace as we please God with faith in His Word. There's emotional comfort. How many of you are frazzled? How many of you just, you know, why don't you take your eyes off the world and look upon the Lord Jesus Christ? Spend time with Him. You know, you, you got an iPhone, you got a computer, you got a laptop, whatever it is, you can put a Bible app on there. You can you can just fill your day up with God, with truth, Bible truth, and believe it. Believe it. Emotional comfort. Rest your mind, will you? God has been satisfied with Jesus' sacrifice for sins, not yours. <coughs> Pardon me. And then there's physical rest from self-harm. These people who do these hurtful things to their bodies, thinking that it's going to please God or <clears throat> it's going to make him feel sorry for them. Uh, you can't make God feel sorry for you. He's not willing that you perish. You have to seal your own fate. You're either going to be in glory with him because you chose to be and put faith in Christ, or you're going to hell because you thought you were all sufficient yourself. Now, to my brothers and sisters who already have believed and are already resting in the rest that God gave them, for what Jesus has done for us in the past, our service to him should be an honor. It to be an honor to serve God. You know, we ought to be scrambling to be the first to report for service. I don't mean a service here in the church, in the church house. But I mean, Lord, what would I happy to do? Every day, Lord, what, what would you have me to do? I'd like to do this. Do you think that's a good idea? Search the scriptures and think about it, you know? Uh, <clears throat> how much money do you just spend on yourself? You ever think how much money you pay in taxes? So to a state who really doesn't care about you? Or a federal government who's not really doing a good job in protecting you? 
Do you ever count how much money of your paycheck that you work for, that you sweat for, goes to them? Now, I'm not getting political, but I want you to see something. And then think about how much you give to God every week. Listen, you, got, you owe God everything if you're saved. And if you're not saved, get saved. <clears throat> but it ought to be an honor. And you ought to be first in the church house to come in early, expecting good things from the Word of God. The only reason you don't is because you're lazy and you don't care. Or you got a physical problem. We should see it also as a duty. The duty for what Jesus Christ has done for us. Although we do not work to enter into heaven, we work out of gratitude to please God who loves us so much. So we ought, to, we ought to see it as a duty. We see it as a duty to go report to our employer. We see it as a, as a duty to, uh, well, most of you do probably obey the stop signs and the you know, road signs out there. <clears throat> you think it's a duty to, you know, uh, uh, care for other people. What about God? Well, what's God need? Well, he, God probably doesn't need anything. He could destroy everything on this planet, you included, and it wouldn't matter to him so much. But he's not willing that you perish. We ought to also reckon it our reasonable sacrifice according to Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. A reasonable sacrifice to come to church for a couple hours a week, to read the Word of God during the week, to understand, try to understand God in your position in the world. Try to think about those things. For the joy Jesus has promised us now and into the future, as believers, we ought to consider our own afflictions, whether they come through persecutions for believing, or sufferings, or sickness. We ought to consider those things as a cross to endure as it was for him to bear our sins in his own body when he was Nailed to that cross. Hebrews 12, 2 and 3 says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him, Jesus Christ, that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be weary." and faint in your minds. Listen. God doesn't want to do you any harm, so stop harming yourself. Come to Him. Get the rest that He offers. It's free. And may the Lord bless His word to you today. Thanks for tuning in. Hope to see you next time. Well, hope to see me next time anyway. God bless you.